Biological Information, Mendel's Account, and Abida. <clears throat> We've been discussing the book, Biological Information, New Perspectives, um, edited by a number of people that uh, are in the intelligent design movement, and Bruce Gordon, who is not. Um, World Scientific Publication uh, Publishing Company uh, prepared the book uh, in 2013. It was the results of a symposium held in uh, 2011 at Cornell University um, and uh, run by a Cornell professor, but not actually part of uh, Cornell's official stuff. And it's available online for free. Um, I think World Publishing stepped in when Springer Verlag stepped out, uh, and I think they deserve to be supported, but the book is expensive. Um, and I'm sorry, there's the book itself. And then um, the book is divided into a general introduction, information theory and biology, which we've been through, biological information and genetic theory, theoretical molecular biology, and biological information and self-organizational complexity theory, which is, of course, not ID, but is uh, skeptical of the power of standard neo-Darwinianism to answer the questions that are needed. And we're in the biological information and genetic theory part. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the uh, paper that we're looking at is Mendel's account and Navida is my short title. It's the, the title that's actually there, Computational Evolution Experiments Reveal a Net Loss of Genetic Information Despite Selection is a complicated and it doesn't give you what they're actually looking at. Um, it's by Chase Nelson and John Sanford. Um, and uh, Chase Nelson is with Rainbow Technologies. And of course, John Sanford is with Cornell. The abstract starts, computational evolution experiments using the population genetic simulation, Mendel's accountant, have suggested that deleterious mutation accumulation may pose a threat to the long-term survival of many biological species. By contrast, experiments using the program AVIDA have suggested that purifying selection is extremely effective and that novel genetic information can arise via selection for high-impact beneficial mutations. The present study shows that these approaches yield seemingly contradictory results only because of disparate parameter settings. Set the parameters the same, and you get the same answers. Both agree when similar settings are used, and both reveal a net loss of genetic information under biologically relevant conditions. Further, both approaches establish the existence of three potentially prohibitive barriers to the evolution of novel genetic information. One, the th selection threshold and resulting genetic decay. Two, the waiting time for, to beneficial mutation. And three, the pressure of reductive evolution. That is, the pressure, selective pressure to shrink the genome and disable unused functions. The adequacy of mutation and natural selection for producing and sustaining novel genetic information cannot be properly assessed without a careful study of these issues. So, mathematical models and numer numerical simulation have long suggested that the accumulation of slightly deleterious mutations may pose a threat to the long-term survival of many biological species, including humans. That's in the literature. Computational evolution experiments with Mendel's account have predicted a substantial fitness decline in the human species under biologically relevant conditions. And note the yellow ellipses are mine, and uh, I'm not going to read this straight through. Um, if you see something in pink, I would do it in red, but then colorblind people can't tell. Um, that's the emphasis that I'm putting in as in below. Moreover, experiments with biological organisms have raised similar concerns, revealing that the majority of adaptive mutations cause a loss of functionality. Lethal mutagenesis may also play a key role in pathogen attenuation, which we'll hopefully be talking about next week. 
recently, however, experiments using the digital genetic software Avida has suggested that purifying selection can be extremely effective and that novel genetic information can arise via selection for high impact beneficial mutations. Avida researchers have claimed a high degree of biological relevance for the program. Note, they think it's pretty good, as we can, will see they know better, using it to address numerous biological questions. In this study, we investigate why Avida and Mendel's accountants yield seemingly contradictory results. We find that most discrepancies are due to differences in default settings. Mendel's default settings implement values plausible for modeling the human species, while Avida's default settings have virtually no parallel in biological systems. Additionally, Avida introduces several unbiological mechanisms for both for facilitating the development of novel genetic information and for preventing its loss. The most notable deviations from biological reality include the distribution of mutational fitness effects, the waiting time to high impact beneficial mutation, and the selective neutrality of inert genomic material. When used with more realistic settings, Avida's results agree with the other studies, including Mendel's account, that reveal a net loss of genetic information under biologically realistic conditions. The results reported here suggest that three substantial barriers may prevent the evolution of genetic information by mutation and natural selection, and we've read those three. Implications for theory in medicine are discussed. Mendel's accountant. Detailed description of Mendel's accountant, hereafter Mendel, are available elsewhere, and default settings are described in the methods. The program is open source and is available online. I'm not going to say anything more than that uh, because we've uh, covered Mendel's accountant uh, fairly thoroughly in our previous um, uh, talks. However, Avida, we have not discussed much. Avida differs from Mendel in that it represents genomes directly using machine code instructions and generally requires more computer science knowledge for use and in interpretation of results. 26 genomic instructions are defined in the software and each performs a specific computational task, for example, adding two numbers. Individual genomes called digital organisms consist of about 100 instructions and undergo random mutation at a user-defined rate. So you can adjust that. Mutations may substitute, insert, or delete instructions at random. The avidian organisms are themselves housed on a two-dimensional grid. Replication is asexual with daughter cells randomly replacing one of the eight surrounding neighbors, or I suppose three surrounding neighbors if you're at a corner. Because of this, replication rate determines fitness in Avida. Any change that allows an organism to copy its genome and replicate faster will allow it to replace other genomes, and its frequency in the population will increase. Each organism in Avida has an associated merit value that determines its relative replication rate. This value reflects both genome size and ability to perform one of nine computational functions, logic operations. Making merit proportional to genome size implements a scheme called size neutrality in which larger genomes are artificially given extra computational time. This removes the selective pressure to shrink genomes, making organisms with identical phenotypes but different genome sizes equivalent in fitness. Because of this, acquiring merit bonuses by performing any of the nine logic operations is the primary means See, so normally it would be shrinking your genome. It's the primary means by which organisms increase their replication rate in Avida. These functions arise when random mutations produce particular combinations of instructions that cause the function to be executed. For example, the simplest logic operations, NAND and NOT, uh, can occur when the instruction NAND arises in the correct combination with input, output, and labeling instructions. Considering its frequent application of, to biological questions, Avida's default range of beneficial mutations, fitness effects, is curiously high. The two simplest operations have a multi multiplicative merit bonus of two, doubling an organism's fitness, produce twice as many offspring per unit time as 
you'd expect. Bonuses increase exponentially with the complexity of a function, and EQ, the most complex function in AVIDA, multiplies fitness by 32. And you can see, and what's more, if you have a not and a not and and an and and an or not, all four in your program, you don't multiply it by four, you multiply it by two times two times four times four. For purposes of biological comparison, relative fitness may be defined as W equals one plus S, where S is a mutational fitness effect, how much better it actually makes it, and W is the relative fitness of an organism uh, expressing a particular function as compared to its function-free ancestor. Mutational fitness effects therefore range from 1.0, that's uh, twice as good, so, you, so it's one plus one is two for the total effect, W, um, to 31.0, which of course gives you 32 if you add one to it, under Avid as default settings. The program is available online and more detailed descriptions of the software are available elsewhere. A previous study has demonstrated that seven of the nine logic operations arise by mutation alone in AVIDA without selection reflecting their, without selection, reflecting their informational simplicity within the software environment. Under default settings lasting about 10,000 generations, an average of 8.6 plus or minus 0 0.7 such functions successfully evolve, that is rise above a frequency of 50%, increasing fitness by an average of 20 million fold. They put out 20 million answer, uh, descendants for every one that the original does. Increases of this magnitude are enabled by the large multiplicative fitness bonuses assigned to the logic operations. You can go all the way up to 33,000 plus. Fitness increases observed in biological evolution experiments are negligible by comparison. For example, in experiments with E. coli, this is real life, more or less, real uh, agar anyway. Um, fitness increased only by 75% after 20,000 generations. That is 1.75 instead of 33 million. Interestingly, the Avidian logic functions are prevented from reaching fixation by the relatively high mutation rate, approximately 0 0.85 mutations per genome, so it never actually completely locks off the old ones. Fitness eventually levels off as only nine functions are available. Although Avida's default mutational fitness effects range from 1.0 to 31.0, the user may specify other values. Using alternative values ranging from 0 to 1.0, Nelson and Sanford, these are the same people that wrote this article, use an empirical approach to demonstrate that Avidian populations experience a selection threshold or critical fitness effect below which drift dominates the behavior of mutation. About ha half the functions evolve or rise to a frequency of 50% with fitness effects of approximately 0 0.2. So 1.2 total. The empirically de determined threshold value with fitness effects of less than 0 0.075, no new functions evolve and those that have previously evolved break down. Selection threshold in genetic entropy. Mueller was one of the first to allude to selection threshold, writing in 1964 that there comes a level of advantage that is too small to be effectively seized upon by selection. Population size is the most studied factor affecting this selection threshold and its role is expressed in Kimura's inequality, S is less than 1 over 2 NE, which we've seen before. However, many other factors influence the efficacy of selection, including the developmental can uh, canalization and environmental effects. Any factor that influences reproduction in a way that is independent of the genotype will raise the threshold, causing more mutations to behave as if they were neutral. The point is well summarized by Irie Walker and uh, Kitely. It seems unlikely that any mutation is truly neutral in the sense that it has no on, effect on fitness. All mutations must have some effect even if that effect is vanishingly small. However, there is a class of mutations that we can effect a term effectively neutral. As such, the definition of neutrality is operational rather than functional. 
It depends on whether natural selection is effective on the mutation in the population or the genomic context in which it segregates, not solely on the effect of the mutation on fitness. Now, I want to emphasize this. Nye has pointed out that natural selection operates as a result of the population of different, different genotypes, production of uh, different genotypes in a population, and is therefore not the fundamental cause of evolution. Selection can only alter the survival of var a variation that has already risen in nature. I read the paper. It's available online. They say that. They really do. You may have heard that creationists were accused of saying this and that they're, they're full of baloney natural selection. Of course, it has uh, creative power. The fact of the matter is they know better, or they should know better. As a result, net fitness can decrease even when natural selection is successful. It is obvious that the potential lethality of deleterious mutational load is magnified when selection is less effective. Because the majority of mutations are deleterious, random genetic drift imposes a high degree of directionality on evolution by favoring the fixation of mutations that decrease fitness. These issues have caused concern about the long-term survival of numerous species, including humans, inspiring titles like Contamination of the Genome by Very Slightly Deleterious Mutations, Why Have We Not Died 100 Times Over? No compelling solutions to this paradox have yet emerged, though many possibilities have been proposed. And there must be an answer, because otherwise evolution would be wrong, and we know better than that. Especially in species with large genomes, it is possible that mutation rates are so high and deleterious mutations so common that genetic information cannot be maintained, a process known as genetic entropy. The aforementioned experiments with Avida had demonstrated genetic entropy, providing empirical evidence that selection thresholds exist and showing that ineffective selection may pose a substantial barrier to the evolutionary origin and maintenance of complexity. Experiments using Mendel have provided further evidence of a selection threshold. The present study explores, explores potential barriers to the progressive evolution of novel genetic information by pursuing several lines of experimentation with Mendel and Avida. First, Mendel is used to replicate results obtained under Avida's default settings. This demonstrates Mendel's versatility and reveals the parameters that are necessary to obtain results typical of an Avida experiment. Two additional sets of Mendel experiments are performed, one using default settings and another using settings more conducive to the occurrence of high-impact beneficial mutations. Next, Avida is used to pursue two additional questions. First, functional precursors of the equal operation are assigned neutral fitness effects in order to explore the evolutionary origin of complexity when beneficial mutations are not readily available. Second, various mechanisms preventing reductive evolution adaptive loss of genetic material and functionality are disabled and the evolutionary consequences observed. Methods, now I'm going to just buzz through this. If you will really want the details, they're in the book. Again, it's online for free. Uh, the results, experiments using Mendel's accountant under Mendel's default settings, end of experiment fitness declined to an average of 0.76 after 500 generations. Populations contained an average of 4,900 uh, deletion mutation, deleterious mutations, and 0.03 beneficial mutations per genome. Figure 1 displays the, uh, figure 1a displays the fitness trajectory of a case study population under these conditions. And we've seen this before. Notice that there is one beneficial mutation right there. Under settings designed to approximate results obtained under Adiva's, uh, Avida's default settings, lasting 10,000 generations, fitness increased to an average of 3, 35 million plus, ranging up to 126 million plus, relative to the uh, ancestral population. These results matched Avida very well, which produces an average fitness increase of approximately 19 million plus. Populations contain an average of 62.7 plus or minus 5 deleterious mutations and 8.8, .8, almost 9, beneficial mutations per genome.
Figure 1 displays the fitness trajectory of a case study population under these conditions. And note this is a log. So if this were done in actual size compared to the first one, you would have to have a screen higher than Mount Everest to display it. This goes up fivefold, that goes up fivefold again, which is 25-fold, and so forth. To explore evolution under conditions similar to the default settings, but more favorable to beneficial mutations, the proportion of beneficial mutations was increased to 0 0.001, 1 in 1,000, with a maximum effect of 0 0.5. Heredity was, heritability was increased to 0 0.5, and experiment length was increased to 1,000 generations. Under these conditions, end of experiment fitness declined to an average of 0 0.8, and always declining, um, with an average of 9,000 plus deleterious mutations and 14 plus beneficial mutations per genome. And here's a typical display. And you'll notice that you have one really, really beneficial mutation and then several little beneficial mutations, but the rest of it is all going downhill. Although no end of experiment fitness, fitnesses were above the ancestral fitness 1.0 at the end. Fitness did arise above 1.0 during the course of three, and you saw one of them, of these experiments with a maximum of 1.01, so that was probably the maximum. One of these cases is shown in Figure 1C. Here, a high-impact beneficial mutation, fitness effect of approximately 0.2, occurred around Generation 270 and rapidly moved to fixation. No other mutations, beneficial or deleterious, reached fixation over the 1,000 generations of this experiment. End of experiment fitness was 0 0.85. Experiments were conducted with AVIDA to determine how many functional precursors must be rewarded to enable the evolution of EQ in AVIDA. Results are summarized in Figure 2. EQ never evolved when seven or more precursors functions were neutral. It also never evolved with six neutral precursors under the complex to simple scenario and evolved only once with six neutral functions under the simple to complex scenario. And you can see uh, most of the time it evolves with one or zero. With one or two, mm, this is probably statistical noise. By the time you get down to five, you definitely have dropped. And by the time you get to six, you got one case. And seven, eight, or nine, it's not going to happen which incidentally is just about what you'd expect from bacteria. These findings expand the results of other studies in which EQ never evolved uh, when all simpler functions were neutral, and certain combinations of neutral functions involving NOR or XOR were found to hinder the evolution of EQ. The evolution of XOR in EQ, therefore, requires selection for functional precursors, and at least two precursors must be rewarded for EQ to evolve. EQ is more likely to evolve when relatively complex operations are rewarded because complex operations are less likely to arise without a selective advantage. Hitchhiking of neutral functions to high frequencies was common in these experiments. AVIDA experiments were also performed to examine the evolutionary consequences of selection acting on genome size. Results not shown but we're done. Fewer functions evolved when size neutrality mechanisms were disabled. Well, duh. And this difference was more pronounced for organisms with smaller genomes. EQ evolved less often and end of experiment fitnesses were lower for both genome sizes of 50 and 100. Though genome size tended to increase somewhat during de uh, under default settings, this pattern was reversed when size neutrality was not enforced. Therefore, it's actually not quite size neutrality. It favors the bigger organisms from the looks of it. Therefore, size neutrality artificially facilitates the evolution of complexity in AVIDA, presumably by maintaining inert genetic code that can be used as raw material for evolutionary innovation. A previous study demonstrated, we're into the discussion, and this is the rich stuff, demonstrated that a fitness effect 
selection threshold exists in AVIDA, defined as the mutational fitness effect at which natural selection and random genetic drift contribute equally to the face fate of a, a mutation in the population. Practically, this is the fitness effect for which positive selection successfully captures half of the beneficial mutations that arise. In AVIDA, this occurs at a beneficial fitness effect approximately 0.2. Of course, this is a lower estimate. Um, moreover, zero new functions evolve when the fitness are less than or equal to 0.075. Likewise, experiments with Mendel have estimated a threshold a selection threshold of approximately 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 3 under conditions typical of mammalia, mammalian populations. In discussing genetic entropy, experiments with Mendel have confirmed the del that deleterious mutations occur accumulate in a linear fashion, fashion despite selection, consistent with biological studies, for example, E. coli. In other words, this is not Mendel itself. This is actually modeling real biological systems that can be experimentally investigated. It is worth emphasizing that the gradual fitness decline shown in Figure 1a and 1c occurred despite the concurrent action of reasonably strong selection. In these cases, selection is simply unable to counteract the net adverse effect of new mutations. <coughs> genetic entropy is not merely a theoretical concern. Numerous analyses have confirmed that the accumulation of slightly deleterious mutations can cause gradual fitness leading to extinction in asexual species, and similar processes are relevant to sexual species, including humans. Lethal mutagenesis of pathogens due to elevated mutation rates and periodic bottlenecking upon infection may also be applicable in novel medical approaches. Um, suggesting that maybe you can take advantage of this, um, trying to get rid of pathogens. Novel means of genetic intervention to reduce mutation rates may be necessary to prevent ex the extinction of numerous species, though it is not unclear whether this would be feasible. Probably need to do it, but don't know if we can. <coughs> Excuse me. High impact beneficial mutations. The Mendel case study displayed in Figure 1c is an informative example of the effects of high-impact beneficial mutations. A single high-impact beneficial mutation, fitness effect of approximately 0.2, occurred around Generation 270, offsetting the effects of approximately 2,643 deleterious mutations in the individual in which it arose. Beneficial mutations with large effects have certainly occurred in nature. For example, in the presence of an antibiotic, the fitness effect of any mutation conferring drug resistance is so large as to be mathematically undefined as the un ancestral fitness is rendered zero in that environment. Other examples of high impact beneficial mutations have been reported in viruses in the presence of heat. However, even though these mutations are beneficial in their respective environments, they work by damaging or eliminating genetic information, not producing it. This phenomenon highlights one disadvantage of Mendel's account, namely that it treats evolution merely as an accounting problem in keeping with traditional population genetics. Evolution is seen as an exercise in fitness addition and subtraction without any reference to the underlying genomic mechanisms or architecture. If you make it fitter by making it smaller, you're not increasing information. This favors progressive evolution, that is, it allows single beneficial mutations of large effect to compensate for large numbers of deleterious mutations. However, even though this model is clearly more condu conducive to progressive evolution, there are several reasons why it is not biologically realistic. Scenarios in which large numbers of deleterious mutations are regularly offset by relatively few high-impact beneficial mutations lead inevitably to shrinkage of the functional genome. If such beneficial mutations are the sole source of progressive evolution, the functional genome must shrink each time evolution takes a step forward. That's not going to get you from amoeba to people. This type of change is not sustainable and cannot constitute the sole source of progressive evolution. Instead, plausible scenarios of progressive adaptive evolution must allow the deterministic elimination of most deleterious mutations through purifying selection. If you can't purify it, 
uh, it's not going to work. Additionally, the gradual accumulation of beneficial mutations through natural selection must have the potential to build every complex biological fe feature requiring explanation. This process requires qualities of linkage and functional integration that cannot be adequately represented with numerical simulation, at least not at this level. Distribution of mutational fitness effects. The mutational fitness effects implemented under AVID as default settings, 1 to 31, are extremely rare or non-existent in the biological realm. Uh, maybe you can find it in viruses. This renders published AVID results irrelevant to the great majority of biological mutations. Some readers may object that while AVID's fitness effects are too large, those implemented in Mendel are too small. On the contrary, it is well established that, one, most uh, mutations are deleterious, and two, most mutations have very slight effects. For example, a recent study of non-essential ribosomal genes in Salmonella typhimurium examined a total of 126 single base pair substitutions. These are the standard SNPs. Revealing that 120 were weakly deleterious and six were neutral or nearly neutral. At least they couldn't measure a deleterious effect. How many are deleterious? It looks like about 2% we're not. Mm. No. One third. Uh, one thirtieth. One out of thirty were were nearly neutral. The rest of them were uh, were measurably deleterious. Average deleterious selection coefficients were zero point zero zero nine six and zero point. 0131 for, for synonymous and non-synonymous mutations respectively. Synonymous mutations cause deleterious effects. Apparently there's more to the code than what we think. No significantly advantageous mutations were found. So if you're estimating here you'd have to say that it's less than one in a hundred on the average. And no mutations caused a complete loss of function. In humans, most non-synonymous mutations in protein coding regions have effects in the range of 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 1. So salmonella matches humans. Moreover, mutations in functional genome regions of the genome that are non-protein coding are likely to have even smaller effects. But they're still going downhill anyway. Junk DNA. A final concern is the existence of inert or junk DNA. That is, genomic material for which mutation does not affect functionality. It does not seem possible that many genomic sites play functional roles that are at least partially independent of sequence. Avida accounts for this by specifying no operation instructions for 85% of the ancestral genome. So they set up junk DNA, but it's actually pure um, blank page DNA, not junk. Um, Mendel also corrects for this possibility in two ways. First, Mendel models only the effective or functional genome size, so they ignore the other 90%. 10% uh, is the default. Second, to account for truly neutral mutations, only the genomic rate of mutations affecting fitness, not the total range, is used in default settings. Makes the math much easier. The above considerations grant the common assumption that approximately 90% of the genome is indeed junk. And remember, this is written before ENCODE. However, this has been subject to challenge for some time. Importantly, the term junk DNA was first introduced by Ono not as a result of experimentation, but rather as a theoretical necessity to avoid the evolutionary barrier of genetic entropy. As Ono is said in his quote, there seems to be a strict upper limit for the number of gene loci which we can afford to keep in our genome. Consequently, only a fraction of our DNA appear to function as genes. The moment we require 10 to the 5th gene loci, we have 10 to the 9th in humans. The overall deleterious mutation rate per generation becomes 1.0, which appears to represent an unbearably heavy genetic load. Even if allowance is made for the existence in multi multiple hits of certain genes, it is still concluded that, at the most, only 6% of our DNA base sequence is utilized as genes. 
More than 90% degeneracy contained within our genomes should be kept in mind when we consider evolutional change in genome sizes. It is not likely that these sequences came into being as a result of positive selection. Our view is that they are the remains of hist nature's experiments which failed. They have to be there. This reasoning is common. For example, upon reporting a human mutation rate of 64 mutations per generation, Drake et al. note that it is hard to imagine, I'm sure that's what he meant, that, or they meant, that so many new uh, deleterious mutations each generation is compatible with life, even with an efficient mechanism for mutation removal. Thus, the great majority of mutations in non-coding DNA must be neutral. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here because we've been here for too many millions of years. Following the introduction of, junk, of the junk DNA concept, many biologists quickly adopted the selfish DNA mechanism to explain repetitive DNA, suggesting that the search for other explanations may prove, if not intellectually sterile, ultimately futile. And they may be partly right, by the way. If these are mobile genetic elements and they were introduced by someone other than the creator, uh, they may very well be selfish DNA. Um, pathological DNA, at least. Um, other, others resisted this line of reasoning and suggested that repetitive DNA may function in gene regulation. A full discussion of the functionality of non-protein coding DNA is beyond the scope of this study. However, it is worth noting that junk DNA assumptions have proved to be largely incorrect. While hypotheses su suggesting functionality are being increasingly vindicated, Maddock has remarked that the junk DNA dogma may be a classic story of orthodoxy derailing objective analysis of the facts, in this case for a quarter of a century. It may well go down as one of the biggest mistakes in the history of molecular biology. These findings revive the concerns of Ono that human exper humans may experience an unbearably heavy genetic load, that is, genetic entropy, and suggest that human fitness may decline substantially in the coming generations. Irreducible complexity in the waiting time to beneficial mutation. All nine logic operations in Avatar require the coordination of multiple instructions, yet it has been shown that seven of these operations arise even without a selective advantage, indicating that they're relatively simple in the Avida environment. Imagine trying to create a protein that way. By contrast, XOR and EQ require selection for functional precursors. At least two precursors must be rewarded for EQ to evolve. You can't do it with just rewarding EQ itself. It won't happen. Indeed, billions of mutations have occurred in long-term evolution experiments with E. coli, greatly exceeding the number of possible point mutations in its genome of about 4.6 million base pairs, suggesting that all beneficial one-step mutations have likely been tested. Many adaptive steps, therefore, seem to require multiple changes, yet the waiting time increases exponentially with each additional genomic site required to change. If the waiting time becomes too great, a particular adaptive step can prevent an adaptive scenario. The Avida results reported here demonstrate that this evolutionary barrier can indeed be prohibitive. On the one hand, it becomes clear from protein studies that the proportion of amino acid sequences that can be translated into functional proteins is very small. For proteins of about 100 amino acids long, there are 2 to the 100, or 10 to the 130 possible sequences. Yet only about 1 in 10 to the 74, or 10 to the 63, depending on which study you believe, are capable of forming functional s structures. And most enzymes in an organism, such as E. coli, are over 300 amino acids long. So in other words, that's a gross underestimate of how bad it is. By comparison, it has been estimated that only 1 in 10 to the 120th to 10 to the 140th quantum particle interactions can have occurred in the entire universe since the Big Bang, which is the base of, of uh, Dembski's 10 to the 150th uh, universal probability bound. And the probabilistic resources relevant to chemical reactions on Earth allow only about 10 to the 170, uh, 10 to the 70 events. So in other words, if everything was trying to get one particular organism, uh, you're not likely to get it. 
It is clear that Earth has insufficient probabilistic resources for generating even one functional protein sequence by chance. X provided a detailed mathematical treatment of this evolutionary barrier. There is not enough time in Earth history for mutation to generate an, any adaptive step involving greater than six genomic sites in any speci species. Uh, notice that it, um, six was the top number also for Avida, not rewarding it. Several studies have alluded to these limitations. Orr has noted that natural selection is essentially constrained to surveying those sequences that differ from wild type by single point mutations. Double mutations are too rare to be of much evolutionary significance. Similarly, the eventual stasis observed in long term evolution experiments with E. coli has been explained thus. Either further major improvements with fitness and increments of more than a few percent in this environment do not exist, or else they are evolutionary in, evolutionarily inaccessible. For example, adaptations requiring multiple genetic change in which the immediate intermediate steps are unfit. Do you know what that complicated thing is? That's irreducible complexity. That's what that is. They know that it's a problem. They don't want to admit it. Durrett and Schmidt have calculated that the waiting time for a beneficial step involving only two sites, assuming a neutral intermediate, is roughly 100 million years in humans. Yet humans are thought to have diverged from chimpanzees within the last 10 million years. Uh, six million years, actually. Moreover, the challenge of generating the necessary adaptive mutations is complemented by the subsequent, the subsequent challenge of their fixation. The concept of irreducible complexity has had a great impact on the biological community, with numerous studies attempting to dismiss its importance. Avida has been used for this purpose. Ironically, the program confirms that the problem is real is a reality by introducing what Dembski and Marx have called the stair-step active information in order to evolve the EQ function. That is, it provides information about the target by rewarding the necessary building blocks, each of which can feasibly be constructed by mutation alone. So each single step mutation gets rewarded. Then you can get evolution. Without that, you can't. Um, and this uh, the ball wants to go higher. That's not instinctive, okay? So you're trying to get from here to here. You have to go through a valley here. It doesn't want to do that. If you have to go on a level plane, it'll wander around for a long time before it finally finds its way up here. This is a simple pathway, but when you realize it doesn't have to go straight, it can go off in other directions, you realize that at a certain point, it's unlikely to find what you need. Avida has the stair step where each step is rewarded. To justify the fitness scheme implemented by Avida, Lenski et al. have mere, noted merely that this is precisely what evolutionary theory requires. So you make it so that it fits evolutionary theory, and the question is, does it fit real life? Remember, we were arguing earlier that it did fit real life. Reductive evolution, for example, in a classical series transfer experiment with QB bacteriophage, replication rate increased by a factor of 15, and genome size decreased by 83%. Basically, it got rid of everything that wasn't just pure replication. With biological competency, that is the actual virus that we started with, lost by the fifth transfer. So some reductions in genome size have also been observed in evolution experiments with E. coli. There, uh, e. coli loses information, viruses loses information. Why doesn't Avida lose information? Because we don't want it to. Long-term evolutionary experiments with E. coli have provided numerous examples of this process. One mutation that reduced GLM-US expression by 10% was highly beneficial, as was another mutation that reduced spot expression. Moreover, Cooper and Lenski have reported that unused catabolic functions de decayed as fitness increased in agar, of course, in 12 experimental populations of E. coli, reducing diet breadth. In other words, if all you're going to eat is agar anyway, well, you adapt to eating agar, but then you lose the ability to eat other things. 
One mutation, loss of the ability to use, use deribose, occurred in all 12 populations in the first 2,000 generations because they've got plenty of ribose to, they don't need it. Increases fitness by, in this artificial level, by 1.4%. Artificial size neutrality mechanisms were introduced into the Avida software as a means of preventing the pressure of reductive information. The advantage gained by shrinking the code is so dramatic, however, and this is a quote, that cells might even choose to shed sections of code that trigger moderate bonuses, and this is my ellipsis. Note that enforcing the size neutrality is strictly speaking unbiological as it is known that self-replicating strings will shed all unnecessary instructions if given the opportunity. In Avida, size neutrality is necessary in order to jumpstart the evolution of complexity. It's unbiological, but we need it in order to demonstrate evolution, so we'll put it in our program. Think about that. That's their words. Conclusions. And this is our last slide except for my comments. The apparent disparity between the two programs, Avida and Mendel's accountant, result primarily from differences in settings. While both Avida and Mendel demonstrate that neo-Darwinian evolution may be a theoretical possibility under certain circumstances, both programs also suggest that it is not a plausible explanation of most biological information. As science commentator David Berlinski has remarked, computer simulations of Darwinian evolution fail when they are honest, and succeed only when they are not. Now my take, the data in the chapter simply show what you expect that Mendel's accountant and Avida give similar results when run with similar settings. The discussion is worth reading for its own t sake. <coughs> Strictly speaking, this isn't part of the discussion itself, but it's interesting that, that the opponents admit that natural selection can't create that it's actually the combination that does, and the, the, the actual creation is done by random mutation. Mendel's accountant, in fact, is too kind. It, if anything, it assumes that, um, that uh, deleterious mutations can be canceled out by advantageous mutations. The biologically realistic runs on either program match biological experiments. So they're actually biologically realistic. Most mutations when tested are known to be deleterious. Junk DNA is a virtual requirement of evolutionary theory, which is why you heard howls of complaint when ENCODE suggested that uh, junk DNA may not be as good as everybody thought. Irreducible complexity is recognized by the scientific community as a real problem. They don't want to. They don't want to say. Uh, they don't want to say Behe is right because then that means you actually have to listen to intelligent design people. But that's true. And finally, the design of Avida's defaults was unbiological, and the designers knew it. While in other places claiming it was. Uh, faithful to biology. That's just stunning to me. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. I just give it to you, and then you, anybody that wants it. Okay. <coughs> Comments, questions? Uh, you said um, when it comes to um, complexity, the, um, the issue of um, developing more complex systems, neither Avida um, nor Mendel address that issue of well they they measure you know th they measure fitness as a single number that's that's uh, and that's not addressing the issue of uh, of complexity 
It's not addressing the issue of complexity. It's not ad addressing the issue of changing environments and the fact that fitness changes in a changed environment. For example, E. coli that's in agar doesn't need ribose, and it jettisons the ability to make it, probably saving a few thousand base pairs in the process. But if that E. coli ever escapes from agar and gets back into where it usually uh, sits, it may not find that ribose is that easy to scavenge from the environment, and now it has to make it, and now it's at a disadvantage to the standard variety. And see, this is the thing. <coughs> uh, which, which, which is more fit? Well, it depends on the environment. If you're talking about agar, the ribose deficient one is more fit. If you're talking about, say, the human body, the uh, one that can make ribose is more fit. So that's why it's really important mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, the computer programs are, are assuming that the environment doesn't change much. And they're also assuming that beneficial and, uh, <coughs> and deleterious mutations offset each other. But if the deleterious mutations are attacking a core problem, and eventually they get bad enough to where, let's say, you can't make your own guanine or something, then all the beneficial mutations in the world aren't going to offset that. So, uh, as, as they point out, Mendel's accountant is actually kind to evolution. And even if you're kind to evolution, it still mm -hmm. doesn't work. They, as, as I said once previously, people will argue, well, you don't understand evolution. No, I understand evolution quite well. What you don't understand is that evolution doesn't match real life. And that's what's really going on here. The, uh, the real life issue is that you can find very few simple uh, m mutations that will be beneficial and very few simple biological systems most everything in biology is complicated, uh, complexly integrated. And it looks like these programs don't even address that question. Which, I mean, if you're going to evolve an eye, you're going to have to have more than one mutation. That's right. You're going to have to have thousands of mutations. That's right. Like, oh, th uh, this is a critical <clears throat> point. They're assuming that one or two mutations can make a difference in function. When you have to create a whole new protein to make that function. But this, this is not reality of the biological world. Right. And that's what I'm saying, is evolution, as presently, it, it will work in a highly artificial environment. But it won't work in the real world. And in fact, what's happening is that as time is going on, we're losing information, and uh, basically irretrievably. And that argues, that argues not only that evolution can't work, because you, it's, you know, it's like trying to swim upstream at, uh, at um, you know, a millimeter per hour when the, when the stream is going at five miles per hour. You know, it's just not going to get you there. Uh, but, this, but the second, th yeah, the, 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 the second thing is that if that's the way it really is, you don't even have time for evolution to sit around for millions of years. And that's why John Sanford has gone from being an evolutionist, not just to an intelligent design advocate, but to an actual short-age creationist. So we, we, you have both the, the complexity problem and the entropy problem. That, yeah, that but how are you going to make this stuff? But then how are you going to keep it preserved while you're trying to make it? The sandcastles are crumbling, trying to have the ants put a little um, 
a grain of sand on top of the sandcastle when you know the, when it's getting washed out to sea, it's a losing proposition. Well, um, you said we are losing information. Could you kindly? Every human being has approximately 60 to 100, depending on which study you believe, and probably depending on what they eat and, and what mutagenic stuff they you know, get in their system, um, uh, mutations that the previous generation didn't. And random changes in the genome are not known to be favorable. Uh, when it has been studied, and we saw an example of Salmonella typhimurium, uh, the, uh, all of the def effects that could be detected were deleterious. And that was about 90% of the effect of the mutations could be proved to be deleterious. Which means that you would expect the same thing in humans, and as time goes on, uh, the genome, uh, in other words, of those 100 mutations, you'd expect all of them in, on the average. Maybe if you were lucky, one, you'd expect all of them to be deleterious. Our kids are going downhill. We are downhill from our parents. And if our parents had drank and smoked uh, while we were, you know, why well, we're even further downhill because there's more mutations. Is it in our uh, ability to uh, resist or fight infection, or is it in terms of intellect? The, the Bible says that intelligence will be increased in the last days, and we see it. There's well, it doesn't say it, the so. intellect. It says knowledge, uh, knowledge will be increased. Well, yeah, you're right. Uh, we, we are, as Newton put it, we uh, we're, can see as far as we can because we stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, I wasn't this morning expecting to get to this point, but it seems to me this is an awesome presentation, the content of it. It seems to me to be defining if one can grasp it. I couldn't certainly replicate it, but I, can, I think I've grasped what it's actually saying. So why is it that rational, intelligent, well-trained scientists are still grabbing the straw, which is rotten at its core? There's no direction but downhill to sink on this one for them. It was they've got to come up with something brand new. And the only thing I could think they could come up with is extraterrestrial or something vaguely like that. And that might explain why many intelligent people grasp at that straw because Francis they're not willing Crick to. Francis Crick went there. Right. So, um, I mean, is there any weakness in the presentation? Is there something there that someone's going to come up with? What might it be? I don't see any weakness. I, I mean, I, I'm cautious about saying there isn't any or that somebody won't come up with it later, but I, I don't see any. Uh, and in fact, I, I don't think they see any either, except the, the, the big argument that's used against this kind of thing is, well, we're here. It can't be that bad, which you see kind of begs the question. Well, we're here, and it is that bad, says that maybe we were here because somebody planned it that way. But they don't want to go there. But the best the evolutionist could do is to become an agnostic. Anything else is... Um, deceiving themselves. Well, you know, in Romans it talks about for his power and majesty are known. I think this is one of the things where people, because they don't want to go there, close their eyes. Now, I won't say everybody's in that camp. Some people have never been told. You probably didn't realize it until just now how bad it was. Um, there are a lot of people who don't realize how bad it is because it's not talked about. Right. 
But once you get into that level, you don't really have much choice. It, it seems this book should be reduced into a layman's edition. They tried. Uh -huh. You okay. can review it and see what you think. I'm trying to expand and contract it so that the layman can understand it. That's why I picked this book, is because as I started reading it, I realized that it had so much stuff that the average person just doesn't know. I mean, my reaction this morning is, wow, I never knew the evidence was so strong. You know. um, as far as mutations are concerned, I mean, is there any actual evidence of fact that any mutation has been good? Yes. Uh, I, uh, and, I, and I mean good in the sense not only of the organism does better, but that the organism actually produced four new nucleotides which should be there. Uh, if you go back far enough on our lecture series, you'll find a thing that says evolution works. Uh, in order to do that, they had to get, they had to reward these particular creatures not with two, but 10 to the 17th uh, in terms of its, uh, in terms of its, uh, uh, Reproductive power. Okay, is is this in a? This is not in a model. Then this is not. The, this is in a, an, a a virus. What they did was they took the virus and they clipped out four uh, nucleotides that were used in three different functions. And eventually, the organism put in four nucleotides and then corrected one and then corrected the other and then corrected the other. Interestingly. Most of the viruses didn't do that. It was extremely rare, and in order to get this, you had to reward it, and you had to make it so that the other ones that were adapting in other ways uh, didn't get rewarded. <coughs> um, so what happened with them was that, uh, that they would find a different fix for it, which wasn't as good. and. If you were to just turn the virus loose, well, you couldn't actually turn the virus loose because with the, without these four, if you didn't support it, it wouldn't live. It was on life support, so to speak. Yeah. But they would get out and they would start becoming viruses and do, do, the, do the usual <laughs> virus thing, and they would have swamped the precursors to this final buildup. But you could get the final buildup. It took, you know, I think millions of generations, at least certainly thousands of generations in order to get it to work. And you had to have, um, and you had to have huge reward systems in order to get it to come back. So I, I'm cautious about saying evolution can't work at all. I think Avida demonstrates that it can work, but it's in a highly artificial environment, which is not the usual environment we have on Earth today. I think where, where the system breaks down, we, we can have simple mutations, beneficial mutations. This is, but where the system breaks down is where you deal with entropy and you deal with complexity. And biological systems are very complex. And entropy is a fact of genetics. And the problem is, it's not that you can't pile up enough sand to get there eventually. The problem mm -hmm. is, one, how do you know where to pile up the sand? And two, is the structure getting washed out from the bottom? And the more complex the thing is, the more difficult that is. The more complex it is, the more difficult it is to find where you should put the sand. And the more genetic entropy, the more the bottom is getting washed out faster than you can put it back. And those are the two problems. Well, what you just described is taking what is already there and intelligently designing it so it Proves. So it's still intelligent design. We'll comment in the back. Mm -hmm. How do you know that any positive mutation is a positive mutation and not a program 
that was already placed into the system in the first place. You know, that's where James Shapiro is going. He says it's programmed evolution. That these things actually, uh, the, the, the genome says, I need one of these over here, and so it creates the mutation that it needs. Or in some cases will create several mutations in different uh, descendants so that maybe one of them will be the one you need. But that it's directed mutation. Now that's directed by the organism itself. And you know, it might work, maybe, for getting from organism A to organism B. Where it won't work is if you're trying to get life in the first place. Yeah, I, it seems to me I've sensed that you know, people grab at straws for, as far as this mutation goes when it looks like programming to me and they just call it mutation when it could be a programmed, you know, um, change that would happen under certain circumstances. Well, as a matter of fact, in the human body, the immune system is done specifically that way. There are a huge selective of highly variable regions and variable regions and then constant regions, and you can take uh, one of these and one of these and one of these, and uh, actually the very highly variable regions, I think, can take three or four different ones and stick them together out of however many. So it's, uh, it's actually programmed that way. Uh, once a cell becomes a, an immunoglobulin or, or a T cell receptor, in fact, special receptor um, cell, it becomes a clone and it freezes that process. <clears throat> and the process is, is done by feedback. Oh, this one fits the antigen better than that one and so with time you get better and better fits to the antigen and there it's actually done by random but not really random there are actually whole sequences there that are sitting there on the shelf just waiting for you to pick three and pick two out of here and pick one over here and the one is actually variable too because it uh, you can get IgA, IgE, IgM, IgD and there's one more that I'm, A-E-M-D, and there's one more, I can't, can't remember what the fifth one is. Um, but there's a, whole, there's a whole list of them that, that you can get. G. Um, and, and so, you know, you can, and in fact what happens is that at first, it, if you're attacking a, an antigen that just needs, needs to be cleared out, uh, it'll start out with IgM because that forms big complexes. And then when you get done, the, the body says, okay, we like that, now let's, let's put it into a more productive thing. And it will change the tail end of it from IgM to IgG. Um, a is particularly useful for invasive things in the body. E is useful for things like worms. Uh, and it's, it's, it's programmed. It's programmed randomness, but it's, you know, so there is some randomness to it, and there is some feedback. It's natural selection, if you like, uh, but, it's, but it is not the whole genome and whatever happens, happens. They have to have specific areas, and, and it isn't, it doesn't select out of, you know, if it's on chromosome 6 to begin with, I've forgotten which one it is. It doesn't go back to chromosome 1 and take some pieces out there. It's all, you know, the stuff is all on the shelf there to begin with. They come as need. If there's need for IBM, the IBM is available for all acute situations. Um, yeah, I mean, this is highly, I mean, this is, this is program variation. It's not, it's not random. And that's, and, and, and you could argue that, the, that all of evolution is programmed. You could make a case for that. Of course, now you're going to have to explain genetic entropy in that setting and how we managed to live all that time, or more precisely how the, 
uh, proto mammals that managed to live until they got to us, whatever. But but you know you get to the origin of life and you don't even have that. It's design. They just don't want to go there. If this occurred by random mutations around the genome, uh, how'd they all get together in the same place? You have to have very, very selective mutations to develop a program like that. And until you have several steps working, this program's not going to help. Well, that's the thing. And that's why, uh, even if you can get evolution by doing that kind of stuff, you'd fail at the origin of life. Because you've got to get enough of the stuff to at least reproduce itself to get going. And near as we can tell, that takes somewhere around 150 genes minimum. And that's 150 with 300 bases average in each, uh, in each protein that's produced. Plus, on top of it, you have to have enough protein to make it work. You have to have enough transfer RNAs. You have to have enough... Uh, uh, you have to have enough transcribing proteins so that uh, you can get from the DNA to the RNA and so forth. And well, the more you look at it, the more, it, yeah, it's not going to work. Plus you have to have these all occur at the same time in the same place so you get the first cell so you can get reproduction. Without yeah. reproduction, you're not, you're not going to establish life. Basically, I turned on my computer, which hadn't been booted at all, and an operating system arrived. Exactly. It doesn't seem like any part of the process of creating like life from the proteins or anything is is easy. There's not one part that's likely to happen I individually. And then, like you were saying, it then not just one step would have to happen, but to secure the one steps, other things would have had to occur at the simultaneously, virtually to to secure that in, in any you know, and not continually like a mixing pot of or of some sort. You know, they, they as well, they speak of it as. Yeah, there's one more thing that's really important, and that is philosophically, if you need a designer to create life in the first place then why are we fighting this? Just have the designer, you know, when the Cambrian explosion comes, decide to create bunches of extra proteins. They, they know that if they don't exclude the designer all the way through, they've lost. And then the other thing is once you have a designer, how long it took is far more dependent on the designer's plans than, they, than it is on what natural selection can do if left to itself. So, you know, you either, you either do a complete evolutionary tree all the way through the origin of life, or else th this is nuts. It seems more scientific if, in, in in good science, they would go with the most logical explanation rather than the, l the most far-fetched one, you know. I mean, even if they didn't know ultimately what was the intelligence behind it. One it of these days I'm going to have to come back here with, uh, with real life, um, or at least, well, internet, which is supposed to be real life, uh, examples of people who say it's all in the prior probabilities. And when you realize that, you realize what it says is they have to set the prior probability so low that no evidence really matters. Their words, not mine. Of course, they don't like it when I point out that that's their words. But it, It's interesting even, and I, I wanted you to explain what ex in, in more detail about what the rewards are. I mean, it's not like giving a dog a Scooby snack, you know. I mean, what what is the rewards? What, what are you really talking about Oh, here. the rewards is every 50 cycles of the computer or whatever, instead of producing one offspring, you get to produce two offspring. Oh, so the, the organism realizes that and then it, it 
It, it multiplies faster. It doesn't have it, to realize that. Okay. The, the organisms matter. obviously don't have any clue as think. to what's yeah. going on. Yeah. But it means there's been an intervention. We, we, we like you, you can multiply at twice the rate. We like you, you can multiply at five times the rate. So that would sort of like be like natural selection. But sort it's of. unnatural. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Unnatural selection, you can say, well, these, this half of the flock just don't have enough wool on them. Send them yeah. off to market. Right. We'll let these ones breed. Um, in real life, some of the ones that don't get don't have quite as much wool will be running around faster and therefore get you know maintain the metabolic rate and still breed and even the ones that are cold will probably breed just not as much and the ones that have the really long wool which is what you want they will only breed like one and a half times what the other ones will do you know uh, in order to make that work you have to have the next winter even worse so natural selection is not as good as artificial selection. We can truncate. Nature can't. Yeah, Paul, uh, I studied this 40 years ago. Uh, client filters cannot reproduce, or I don't quite remember if they do. XXY, they, they don't. They, they don't. Uh, well, it's XXY. It doesn't reproduce very well. Right. So um, if something goes uh, way off not the norm, it becomes lethal and so well, that's the problem is, yeah. it, is that you can go way off norm by, by one big mutation or you can go way off norm by gradually decreasing. And that's a problem for, um, for um, endangered species. You know, there's not enough extra. Uh, if you lose one person because of, of bad genes, you're in big trouble. Fortunately, humans on Earth are not a particularly endangered species. <laughs> anyway, tomorrow we're going to talk about how it works in viruses, which is good. <laughs> the, what you were talking about, the blank DNA, as uh, I think he was mentioning. Yeah. Um, yeah, is, is that... I mean, I was thinking when you were saying that, it w probably similar to, to the other guy. <coughs> um, it was like maybe like a blank piece of paper where it could be molded to what Ooh, is ever needed or Yeah, well, well what it is is that they, uh, those particular ones don't do anything. Uh, and if they mutate in just the right way, they might do something. And with this wonderful reward system, then they get trapped and, and they keep going. So they've used those to... They use those to create new functions. To create new functions, I see. So they don't really know, once the, I mean, mutations, they, they don't really know which way they're going to go. And how do they mutate these things? Well, the, they, they mutate it by um, Chemically. having a random number generator, and it oh. says, in position 33, change the 1 to 0. <laughs> That's on a computer program? Yeah. Yeah, on a computer program. Yeah. Uh, and, and DNA, what you'd have to do is on uh, position 454, change the thymine to a cytosine. Yeah. Anyway, see you next week. <laughs>